Hello, everyone, and welcome to IBIT's uh, England's webinar on end modeling be used to educate architects. To introduce myself, I'm Rinja J. Balanayar, a wear number of hats. For IBIT's England, I'm one of the board members and also the editor of our quarterly newsletter. As for my profession, I work as a consultant engineer for Design Builder. Before I move on to introduce our speaker, allow me to mention that if you are not a member of IBIPS England, you can become one for free and we will keep you updated on the latest news, events, job opportunities, etc. And you can use the link that I will post on the chat box later to become a member for free. Also during the webinar, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box and not on the chat box. I repeat, please post any questions you may have on the Q&A box, and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end. Now, to introduce our speaker, we have Professor David Coley with us. David is Professor of Zero Carbon Design at Department of Architecture and Civil Engineering at the University of Bath. His research focuses on minimizing the energy use of buildings through a process of physical design and an understanding of occupant behavior. He's one of the team that built the UK's first zero carbon passive house school. In addition, he is interested in the future weather in a warming world and the implications of building design for occupants. Uh, so I will pass on to David, you can start whenever you are ready. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me on this um, um, webinar. Just to put a bit more on my background, uh, my background is actually uh, one of theoretical phys physics. And I was a physicist who joined a team of people looking at um, energy in society and how we could minimize energy use. And that led naturally into buildings. And when I was young, many decades ago, I was playing around with uh, a building thermal simulation package. And I thought, what would happen if I really pushed the U values, made the building airtight, et cetera, and it was a school. So I started to play with that as an idea and found out, um, as I'm sure other people had, that within the UK context, we could actually design a school that was essentially heated by the pupils themselves. And this is in the UK, so heating is the main issue, not cooling. Um, we then needed to kind of prove that this was doable. And in the end, we raised enough money to build a school, which has, has been built and was just mentioned. And as part of that process, I said to the client that it was going to have no energy bill for the next 20 years. It would all be powered off some PV on the roof and it wouldn't need heating. Um, that's quite a risky thing to promise a client, obviously. And we then needed to deliver it. Uh, and we chose Passive House really not in a philosophical sense, anything to do with energy minimization, but in a delivery sense, because it was a way of guaranteeing um, control on site. And that made me really reassess how modeling is done and when modeling is really useful, because Passive House is done with the Passive House planning package which is a simple spreadsheet using a monthly temperature uh, model. So why were they using this simple model and this simple modeling philosophy rather than anything more sophisticated? And now that I moved from being a physicist into a professor in a department of architecture, I had to think about what kind of modeling should young architects be exposed to? And that's what I'm going to talk about now. I'll just share my screen. Okay. Can someone say that they can see that just by nodding their head or something? Yes, we can see. Okay, okay fantastic. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about energy modeling and architectural education. But I think some of what I'm going to say, in fact, quite a lot, probably um, it would be true in the professional space as well. 
Um, this is the newest building on my campus, um, and it's the School of Management. It's very glassy. You're looking at the north elevation there, and you can see that it's just a sea, a wall of glass. And maybe the architects or the university were trying to think, oh, let's go for a bit of a kind of big city, London, stockbroky, I don't know, feel to it. Um, the campus is way away from um, any large cities. So I can see the logic of doing that, but it rather ironically sits next to the next building on the right there. You can just see in that drawing um, a building poking up and that's our Department of Architecture. And on one of our buildings strapped there is a huge sign saying the University of Bath, carbon neutral by 2030. And I thought there was a bit of an irony having a fully glazed facade um, with therefore not the greatest U value, um, looking at that sign. And I think it's fascinating to consider why it ended up like it did in the current situation where members of the RIBA or of SIBSI have signed up to the climate emergency. Um, so I did some calculations and the error weighted U value of that facade is the same as some 1919 terraced houses because glass double glazing, it's very expensive double glazing, very high performing double glazing, is essentially um, has the same U value as the world's simplest um, um, cavity wall. So you, why had we gone to all this effort? Why did we have modeling, loads of other tools, loads of legislation? when we were actually effectively going to build the same. And that every gain that we made in U values, as far as in a material sense, we got rid of in an architectural sense by just using more of the constructions and materials that have the worst U values. And this is another example from another university where I used to work. Um, and this is the, um, the energy use in terms of CO2 of these two buildings. The top left was built in 1956. Um, the bottom right is brand new-ish, well, it's in the 2000s anyway, um, and with much better U values in theory, but they use the same amount of energy per annum, which is very, very interesting. Um, you know, why, why is something going on in the architecture and in the use of the buildings um, that means we're getting absolutely nowhere. Um, so I had to look at some more national data, you know, rather than anecdotal stuff. And these two graphs, um, the x-axis is the date of the architecture, not the date of the data collection of the energy use. And we've got energy expressed in one there for homes in kilowatt hours and on the left um, for schools in uh, CO2 units. And you can see that very roughly when the date of the construction of a building is not a variable that's at all involved in predicting how much energy it uses, which is quite stunning. You know, cavity walls coming along, double glazing, one or two other technologies coming along. Um, we just can't see it. We're putting a lot of money into buildings in insulation and other things, but they don't seem to be suppressing in the UK the energy consumption, which really makes you think, you know, what are we modeling to achieve except for compliance? Because we're not managing to steer the agenda as a bunch of professionals. And there's graphs like this in various um, documents from various um, engineering and architectural associations. And they all point to the simple story that if you're going to change the carbon emissions or the energy use of a building, you need to do it as soon as possible in the design sequence. So early stage design is when the modeling, if you're gonna use modeling is needed. And possibly one of the biggest roles that modeling could have is in changing the attitudes of where the architect and the client starts from. When they first get the, pen the pencils out, do they draw something that is easy to convert into a very low carbon design? into a passive house or into something, it doesn't really matter what the philosophy is, but into something that's pushing forward in the correct direction with respect to carbon emissions. Or are they just drawing what they want to draw and then asking some consultants to help with the project two years down the line when most of the major decisions on form, glazing ratio, et cetera, 
have been decided. And this is true of student projects as well. OK, so what's the ultimate early stage? The ultimate early stage, I would say, of any design is the education of the designers, particularly the architects, um, during their formative years. It's that that's really when a lot of this stuff gets lodged into the head. It's way before the contract for that particular building is even discussed with a client. So uh, what is the purpose of energy and carbon modeling? Um, you, I would suggest that almost no one wants to know the numbers. Um, not many people even know what um, a kilowatt hour is or a watt is. They're very, very hard things to grab, grab hold of, actually. It's one of the problems with SI units. Um, in imperial units, it's much easier to have some idea of what those numbers are. But we don't really know what a megajoule is. I know what a doorway is that's um, two, two meters high. It's very visceral, but um, you know, we don't, the, the numbers are, are not that relevant. Um, and in fact, some senior members of um, Reba and possibly Sibsi would actually be challenged if shown a building and asked, you know, what's the embedded, embodied carbon of that building? Or how many kilowatt hours does it use per annum? Um, so what, what we want to do, I think, is not really think about the numbers, but people want a lower energy or carbon building. They want to know they're heading in the right direction to meet a target, if that's a legislative target. And they want to compare with possible ways of meeting that target, different wall constructions or something, or different forms. Um, now, I actually think it's a shame that we don't do modeling as a way of educating ourselves um, and of teaching people building physics. You know, when you run a model for an architectural team, how much knowledge do you actually leave, new knowledge? Not about that building, but in general, do we tend to leave um, the architect with? And I would say it's very little on the whole, which is a shame. Um, and I think the same is true when you use some modeling software in um, educational environments, the students can tend to learn a lot about that software, but they don't tend to learn much about building physics and what leads in practice um, to a real low energy building. So they don't learn whether the majority of the heat loss is infiltration, ventilation, is it via the walls, via the windows? You can find all this out from a, a dynamic simulation, but it's almost like you have to be someone you know, wanting to use that tool professionally to dig that deep. So I'd also um, think about how accurate thermal models are, and particularly when we're using them um, in early stage design. So for windows are a classic example. You're designing a school, um, it, particularly in a big practice. It might be in a country you've never visited. How do you know to what angle and when and what triggers do people use to open windows to provide ventilation? You, you end up just bringing your own cultural biases to the table and making some numbers up or setting things to zero because you don't know what the values are. Okay. We're also, when modeling, in a sense, not even discussing the building we're thinking we're modeling in the that building is going to change in the sense, at least in the sense of its occupants and quite possibly what it's used for. So trying to predict whether it's the low or one of two possible ways of putting that building together over the length of the time, lifetime of the building, 100 years, is extremely difficult, impossible, and possibly indicates again that the numbers themselves are not that important. What might work? Well, this is, having thought about this for quite a long time. Um, I think what won't work is the anything that's too complex to use. So particularly for a student, students doing studio work have got to do everything. They've got to do acoustics. They've got to do daylighting. They've got to use, do, think about energy, embodied carbon, fire regulations. They're meant to be learning about the beauty of design and a whole load of other things. So they're not gonna pick up a series of different tools, each with a different interface, learn that tool. Because if they do attempt to do that, although they will put some numeric values into their work and that will be, get their marks up, they'll spend less time somewhere else. And that could be catastrophic 
for their marks. Um, so I don't think tools that can only be used really effectively after the initial design um, is fixed um, of much use at all in the educational market because that is right at the end of that design cycle. We need to start in the right place. We need to start in the head of those students. Um, anything that doesn't talk the same language as architects. Um, so we need to merge energy and carbon. You know, a lot of the people are confused about kilowatts compared with kilowatt hours, um, megajoules, et cetera, tons of carbon, tons of CO2 equivalent. And we've got to kind of sort that out for them. Um, anything you have to go on a course to operate because there's no time in the education environment and an architect in practice doesn't have time. Anything that costs money is a barrier, even when software can be delivered uh, with student versions. Um, there's normally issues about gatekeeping that and licenses, even if the licenses are free. OK, um, so we need to get into the heads of architects in, in the easiest way. And having thought about this for a few decades, this is what I've come up with. Um, modeling needs to be quick. It needs to take, whatever the topic, it needs to take less than one hour. So you need to reproduce, predict the carbon um, emissions from a building in less than an hour using software that you've never used before. And as long as we stick to the fact that the actual precise values are not that important, we can probably achieve something like that. It'd be ideal if the, um, the person was educated along the way, how to um, stop bit sound being transmitted room to room, how to improve daylight factor. Something that pointed at what bits of the design were responsible for the major carbon emissions, if we're talking about carbon. You know, is it the windows? Is it the roof? And it's got to really hit them in the face. And I would suggest the interface needs to look similar or as similar as possible. So Excel has some serious advantages in here because they spent a lot of time with Excel since the age of 12. So I've come up with this term called the gentle art of calculation to try and get architects and architectural students in particular to put numbers into their work, to stop just drawing red arrows and blue arrows, but have meters cubed per hour of, of air movement and the same with energy. So it happens that we teach students simple equations and, and, and methods um, and heuristics. For example, the daylight factor. We teach that and we teach reverberation time. Um, but then we kind of don't ever apply them. Uh, we, we just forget about them. And we move immediately to complex methods and models, doing dynamic simulation, uh, hiring outside consultants if it's in the real world. But what about if we just created suites of tools um, that based on what the students were taught? So if they're examined on the daylight factor using the simple daylight factor, okay, we build a tool on it. Um, if they um, learn about uh, heat loss from a building is energy times U value and then put in some ventilation and then the mean monthly temperature or degree days or whatever it is, well, we should have some really nice tools based on those methods. And then should we encourage them to use them? And one of the things this would do, and it's what we're trying to do at work at Bath, is it kind of gives the students another shot at those equations. And they, they might therefore see what daylight factor, um, what, what the terms are, what are the parameters that matter, or when it comes to energy, what are the driving forces for the energy consumption of a building in the UK. And I return to the fact that if I get a member of the RABA or even of SIPSI to look at a building and say, please give me a pie chart of the energy consumption of that building, just a pie chart, just ratios of heat loss from roof, blah, 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 walls, glazing, ventilator. A lot of people find that very high hard to do, which is strange being we're doing this professionally. So there's a bit of an elephant in the room here. Um, the, a terminology we often see students using, and actually I've bumped into this professionally as well and been involved in court cases where when we've looked at the actual engineering um, reports, there's some pretty big holes. 
And this is the common whole, uh, or the most common whole. There will actually be sentences that say things like, this calculation has been made ignoring ventilation. Because it was early stage design, they didn't know how the windows were going to be used. This model was run ignoring shading from the environment, so adjacent buildings and hills and things like that. So the sun comes up at the, uh, the time it would come up um, astronomically. We calculated the body carbon ignoring transportation emissions for the design options. This is stuff I see all the time in students' work, and um, I see it all the some of the time in professional work when I'm reviewing it. Um, what that you can't ignore any of those things. It's very easy to say that, but actually what you're saying is all windows are assumed to never be opened. That's much more of a red flag, isn't it, to anyone reading that report. We place the building on a rock in the middle of the ocean, not at the site that it's actually on. This is like, whoa, hang on a second. Is any of this important? Should I know about it? The impact it might have for energy use? You know, the client can then say, or the, the university lecturer can then say, well, hang on. We have no idea if the results hold true if transportation is included. I mean, it, it, this, this stuff is quite important. So I would um, suggest that almost any reasonable guess for any unknown parameter is better than zero. And I'm sure in a lot of everybody's work, that's exactly what everyone and one's doing. But I often see the opposite in student work and I occasionally see it in professional work. For some reason, People see ignoring or zero as a different type of number than just going 10. But it isn't, it's just another number. Um, and this is just one example of why it's so important. If you fall out of an aeroplane, um, you're gonna do some parachuting, um, you, you'd be tempted with your school physics to think that the further you fall, the faster you go. But very quickly, you actually meet, make a terminal velocity. And the speed that you're going at is invariant to the time you spent falling or the distance you spent falling, completely contradicting Newton's laws of motion. And it'd be tempting to say, well, that's because I'm ignoring air resistance. Well, true, but what does that ignoring air resistance mean? It means I'm saying the person fell through a vacuum. And this is clearly not true. They did not fall through a vacuum. So. I think if we can get away from ignoring and saying what's actually happening, it's much more helpful, particularly to students, because then they get an idea of what actual driving influences um, there are on the heat loss of a building or um, any other bit of building physics. Um, so conclusion, I would suggest any tool for students must have defaults for everything the student does in input. And these defaults must be explained to the student by the tool, so they know what parameters have an effect, for example, that wall reflectance impacts the daylight factor, rather than just saying I ignored the reflectance of the walls, which you can't do in the equation, you have to set it to something. I would suggest any modeling for, any, for anyone has to include best estimates of anything that will have a major influence on the result. Early stage models often do not, possibly on the grounds that these values are unknown at this stage, but them being unknown, you can't just set them to zero. You need to declare them, say that they were important to the student and say what your estimate is. Um, and taking that all together, um, over the last few years, we've put a suite of programs together called Zebra, um, which are on the web, you can download. And um, you're not meant to be able to see the font on the left-hand side of that slide, but that shows you um, a typical page from Zebra, it's in Excel. Um, and the pinky purple area is instructions and guidance. The right hand area and every sheet has that. And it's not often you see a spreadsheet or a computer tool. You know, when did you last open up a thermal modeling package and the instructions showing on screen are greater than the actual data input area. Um, on the right, um, this one's on uh, operational energy use and it's very similar to PHPP effectively. The brown orangey areas are input from the user, and then you've got some graphs which are output. And if we zoom in, you will see the kind of text you're getting. You know, once a building has been highly insulated, air moving in and out of the building can be, uh, can be the dominant heat flow. So you're getting a kind of re refresh of basic building physics when you're using this tool which I would suggest is what architects and um, students need all the time. They need 
reinforcing information about how to build things, how to design things, and what the driving parameters are, which ones are important, which ones aren't. Okay. Um, Zebra um, Operational Carbon, the one we we're just looking at, has the following workflow. You start off um, by setting out your ethical framework. So do you want a zero carbon building? Do you want a passive house? You know, are you including materials or just operational carbon? And you set that out before you start putting any other numbers into it. Um, you enter your building details, so area of water and things like that. Um, you look at the results and see if your ethical framework has been met. These are for zebra operational carbon. These are the input um, things. Um, and depending on your building, there's 20 to 30 of them. Things like U values, um, thermal bridging, form of the domestic hot water system. You can't ignore that. That's a classic example where you're doing any, it's easy to, to, you know, to drop into a, a, a dynamic simulation package and um, do a building without lights and without hot water distribution and et cetera, which, you know, you, you can't really be doing that. Um, and these are the outputs, or at least some of them. So the students start seeing the solar irradiation on the orientations. Um, it's all text input. There's no 3D modeling here. So actually you can, it's really good for teaching because you can just start with, a, you know, with just areas and things. This is the set points you've set and the, um, the months of the year, the outdoor air temperature, it's a monthly mean. Um, temperature model. And for anyone who's done worked on Passive House, you'll recognize this graph. This is the gains and losses. So what's actually driving the building as far as heat loss and um, fossil fuel use or, or, or whatever. And everything's in kilowatt hours per meter squared, um, which the students certainly like a lot more than anything to do with megajoules. And in this particular building, you can see that incidental gains are more important than the space heating system. Which is, yeah, bang. That's a big thing to write in your little studio, your studio report. But it drills down a lot more deeply. So this is the monthly balance when we need heating, when we don't need heating. I mean, again, that's output. You could output that from your dynamic simulation package. Then we look at each of the windows. And this is the annual energy balance of the windows with respect to heating. There's another one with for cooling. Um, and Zebra works anywhere in the world, heating or cooling dominated environments. And we can see for each group of windows here, um, whether they're in balance, whether they produce um, more solar gains during the winter um, than they lose um, due to their not ideal um, U value. Now, again, you can find this out in um, a dynamic package, but it's actually quite hard to do that. You, you have to be a professional user, I would suggest, of packages to bother to drill down that deep. It's not just a question of, technical knowledge of how to drill that deep, but to bother to drill that deep. And then we end up with the energy consumption of the building um, broken down by sector and the operational carbon um, intensity um, expressed in a series of different ways. This building has PV on it, so it's got a lot of nice generation showing up there. Um, and very useful headline stuff. Um, then we can look at that basically the same data, but in the numeric form, in tabular form. And anything in red here is where the um, software is predicting that you won't meet your ethical framework. So the space cooling demand for this particular building is greater. Maybe we suggested uh, our requirements are on the right there. You know, we wanted it to be zero cooling demand, um, but it's ended up with a cooling demand. Etc. So they can see whether their moral position with respect to carbon or energy um, has been met. Um, and having done that and found it, 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 it's well loved. The students really like using it. Um, and we've spoken to students in the UK and in India and in Jordan um, and in Ireland and one or two other places in the world. And students like it. They really like the fact that it's they recognize Excel. They love the fact that they learn something by using the tool because of all those pink areas. And they know they can put a building in in an hour and therefore they can set aside an hour to do their operational carbon modeling um, at an early stage and use that again and again through the design cycle. 
we found in the past what they were actually doing is um, assembling almost the complete design and then dumping it into IES. And the answers would came out, but they had the modeling had no influence on the carbon emissions of the building. So we think this is not a bad general set of general principles. Provide tools based on what people have been taught. Simple, quick to use. They only use the information to hand with defaults or everything else. But we clearly identify those faults. So you you in um, Zebra Operational Carbon, you could turn um, infiltration off, but you have to go to that extra effort. It's got a default value. In fact, it's got a set of them you choose from, and it uh, it discusses them. You know, are you building a passive house? Are you building to standard um, regulations? And it has that uh, discussion with the user, which is what the users like. Um, and it has this interface that they recognize, partly because it's Excel and partly because all the tools have a very similar look to them. So having, um, having done operational carbon, we moved on and we've been trying to see if there's a general teaching philosophy. Um, so we've got Zebra Sunpath, U-Values, Acoustics, Condensation, Daylight and Embodied Carbon. And um, we will add to that list if people tell us what we like. Please go along to zebramodel.org and um, take a look, if, you know, if you've got the time over lunch or something like that one day and give us some feedback um, that you think might be, hurt, you know, if anyone's going to use it professionally. But uh, quite importantly, you know, what do you think that proto architects during their education years should be exposed to with respect to modeling and what can we deliver in that regard? Um, and actually not just modeling, what should they be exposed to in building physics? Um, and hopefully we can stop this ridiculous state of affairs because the university now has been left with trying to raise a lot of money every year to just pay the heating bill. And you'll notice the ribbon glazing didn't even get the lights turned off in that building, which is very common. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me.